take a look back in history here to some of the um, some of the uh, fundamentals that have been laid in place, certainly psychologically for people, and um, you know if you're not used to seeing volatility, it can be a little daunting. Um, here's uh, something that came about from the crash of 19. 87 uh, in October 1987 investors became sensitized to the potential for a stock market crash and forever changed their view of the S&P 500 returns now that that right there in itself is enough to really chew on and say to yourself in a psychological standpoint as it's been described by uh, the only person I've heard use the metaphor was Mark Douglas and he said that imagine you're bit by a dog it's gonna take you about maybe 10 to 50 dogs that don't bite you before you lose your fear of getting bit and in the, in the nanny state we live started to uh, have here 1987 crash was really not ever bailed out. That was just an, it was just going to happen. People jumped out of windows, and so they decided they were going to put trading curbs. And I remember when that that ridiculousness was going on. Now, so here we are at the uh, uh, 500 returns. Investors now realize that the S&P 500 tail risk. And I'm when I see that term right there, I'm thinking of the wick on a candle. And just the uh, now, the, now the risk of outlier returns two or more standard deviations below the mean. Now we're getting into probability distributions, and you can look at those charts and see how they they really correlate to a skew index. And uh, it's funny that in 1987, three years later, they'd already said, you know what, the Chicago Board says, Trade says, you know, we're going to give you stats. So I captured these images from the Chicago Board of Trade. And because um, I'm not going to buy their data feed that I was paying a mint for back in the old days. But here I had to stretch them out and I put them in paint so I could do some uh, drawing on there and put in my own uh, my own trade levels or my own, um, you know, where I could kind of fine tune it here. Oh, that was supposed to be a uh, like this here. Oops. No straight lines. Right, so that that just about that 140 level, critical, and you could just you could treat this like a trading chart. You know, here's your uh, triangle forming. All right, here's your this. You got this support level here. It breaks out. Boom. This is psychotic. So that's 1998, and that was a climax moment. And the point being here is that if you have a strategy for this, I'm sure the option traders do. Um, when the volatility gets like that and you can start trading a different style different strategy because um, if you're the kind of guy that was making money during all of these situations where it's uh, everything's nice and quiet and everybody's comfy but the comfort level doesn't last long these markets now right we're sitting right at this double top here it's all spiky can we take out the 150 um, and the market get really skewed and distorted is that possible okay let me just go back to this uh written stuff here a significant greater uh, the log normal and I'm uh, I'm thinking logarithmic here distribution as opposed to linear and uh, under a log normal distribution and uh, the skew index is derived from price blah 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 tail whatever the hell anyways you get down here and the, they usually say the last sentence is the only thing that matters right so um, here's the low strike puts increase and I I was in trades like that back when the um, you know, you're sitting in these options that are almost worth nothing, and all of a sudden, blammo. So the option traders definitely, um, you know, they're throwing on butterflies or whatever here, straddles, and you name it. And uh, But the implied uh, curve of implied volatilities, now, this, this is kind of key. Implied volatilities is kind of interesting because, uh, you know, implications and all these words are all tied to psychological um, things of... Uh, you know, this requires more weight. I mean, these are all things that people are, you know, who's not trying to lose weight, right? I mean, everything, everything's so intercorrelated and that the tail risk, to me, 
is this stuff here where it's like, oh my god, you know, look at the tail on that puppy. Now I also have the, um, this is the skew index, and just for kicks I was just playing around with uh, skewing this thing. Um, see if I could if I could skew it, resize it. Well, I guess I can't skew that one. Here's my um, uh, volatility index, and apparently I haven't edited that. I can skew it. I guess I had to save the other one, but just for kicks, I was going to skew this puppy and create my own distortion. I think of 20 degrees. So it's kind of funny if you do a perspective, uh, kind of like how does your brain process things when they're when they're totally uh, out of balance. And uh, I think the uh, I can't remember if it's in this. Anyways, uh, it really was about the steepening of the curve and the fact that when these things are unfair value which in probability um, risk analysis when things go into unfair value that's definitely the auction theory like when it's up in here and you're up in this crazy price forget about it right now this is like what everybody considers to be like normal behavior in here everybody's like yeah that's okay you know or the market's sleeping giant right palamo and uh let me take that and unskew the, unskew the skew. No, I actually wanted to skew the other one, but I drew on it so I couldn't. But here, um, so this is how you normally see it. But man, look at this volatility and just go. The little little comes to life and then blammo. Here's the pullback. Top becomes a bottom. But blammo, and this kind of looks like the 87, 1987 funny uh, gold market where it just went, or you know, everybody's like getting out and then, and then gold came all the way back down. So, uh, if the yeah, the market starts to crash, we're gonna take out this thing, and that was January. This is the 2008 drama. Can we take out that, or are we just gonna go down and just get super quiet for a long time here, where the market, the stock market, just drifts sideways and just tortures every trend trader that's waiting to get paid, and tortures every guy that's just wants to get on the short side, but he keeps getting stopped out, and it goes into this. This malaise, this doldrums, I mean, who really can, but this is just a perfect symmetrical box of just insane, um, i go back to the other, the other index here, now this one, um, let's see if I can't uh, undo all my damage, and then, this is a this is a fascinating one too. That is that is uh, this is choppier looking. The skew index is choppier looking than the volatility index for obvious reasons. It's skewed, right? So, yeah. Look at I mean. So now, this here um, volatility index. Wow, that tells a story. And it can, if you can believe it, I mean, the forex market is on fire right now, volatility-wise speaking. I mean, if you consider the Canadian dollar move with the interest rate change, and you consider the other thing that that they did with the Swiss franc, uh, depegging it, and then just the floor fell out. You know, it's just uh, an amazing, amazing uh, move. And of course, if you were short that, you probably would have to kick yourself and say, "Oh, I should have been shorter or in a bigger er position, and I should have had wider take profits." But holy my God, mackerel! I remember when I was just trying to scalp it there when that happened because I woke up to it and I started to place orders and the problem was that the spread on my one broker went to so wide that I thought, you know, I literally had to jump on this train with a hundred pips stop to try to make ten pips or try to make twenty. I can't make twenty pips with a fifty pip stop, but the problem is that the broker placed me in a position where for you to enter that trade, they're they're basically and that's really what it comes down to here is you think about leverage, volatility, and spreads, that is all part of the game because unless you own, unless you are the central bank, you're paying retail spreads. Like if you go to the bank right now with your Canadian dollars and you're like, oh, look at my Canadian dollars worth so much, you know the spread of the bank's 500 pips. So you're, you got, um, you know, five cent uh, punishment there. Whereas uh, on Forex, even the worst, if you can trade the Turkish Lira, this spread's going to be like 30 pips or whatever. You're going to have uh, and you can scale in and out where the bank, you know, you go down there, you got to wait, you know, it's a big drama. They can bring out the, 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 the paper currency official. Anyways, I'm just saying, but no, I was fascinated by the whole skew thing. I just 
couldn't resist. <laughs> 